we shall draw from the heart of suffering itself the means of inspiration and survival. The eternal words of British statesman and two-time Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Sir Winston Churchill. They aptly describe the willpower of the farmers who have defied great odds to return to their communities after escaping the onslaught of Boko Haram in Nigeria's northeast. Some of the farmers returned to their homes and farms immediately after their communities were liberated from the Boko Haram insurgents. Those whose towns and villages are not safe enough to return to have found land to till wherever they sought refuge. The plight of the farmers who were displaced by the Boko Haram crisis in Nigeria's northeast geopolitical zone is our concern this week on Farmers Market. Farmers Market is a project designed to promote Nigeria's agricultural prowess, identify the challenges besetting the sector, and advocate policies and programs that will help grow Nigeria's agroeconomy. Varieties of highly nutritious rice in Abakaliki, Ofada, Kano. Yet Nigeria wastes billions on rice importation. Cocoa in the southwest, and yet top dollar is spent on imported chocolate and beverages. Fruits rot in Benue, Nasarawa, Kogi, yet imported Jews line the shops. 82 million hectares of rich arable land, yet no jobs and food insecurity threatens. Our real wealth is in farming, livestock, hatcheries, fisheries, horticulture and forestry. It's time to act different. Time to bring Nigerian farmers to the market. Farmers Market, growing Nigeria's agroeconomy. Showing every Tuesday at 5.30 p.m. on AIT. This is the Malkoi settlement for internally displaced persons in Yola, Adamawa State. At least 700 people live here. They are men, women and children who fled from the rampaging Boko Haram in Goza local government area of neighboring Borno State in 2014. From just 50 households, the camp has grown to almost 300 households. This is not an official camp for displaced persons. The residents here are mainly farmers who say that they cannot endure the restrictions imposed on camps run by government officials. The government don't really place any premium here like the camp that has been managed by government because when it started, government will always say people should move to the official camp. If you want government support, you come to the official camp. And if you are not in the official camp, what that means is that you don't get any support. So, but some of these people, they said they are farmers and they cannot stay in the official camp because by the time you go into the official camp, the women are separated from the men. So some of them said they want to stay with their wives or the wives want to stay with their husband, they want to stay with their children and family in one house. So at that point, you, people start showing their preference. And secondly, if you're in the official camp, you're not allowed to go out to do whatever kind of economic activity or skills which you have. By staying here, they can actually uh, put to practice those skills which they have to support them in earning their living. They would rather live in these shanties built with dried sorghum stalks. Their only protection from the elements are canvases provided by an international non-governmental organization, Oxfam, and its local partner, Civil Society Coalition for Poverty Eradication, Cisco. The toilet facilities also provided through donor assistance. Being mostly farmers, they wanted the freedom to practice their trade. Some of the young men selling raw beef and peppered meat. Some of the women helping out on the farms. Others, like Yagana, venturing into a more intricate trade of making perfumes and soaps from tree barks and assorted ingredients. We fetch the wood from the bush. 
We dry its bake. We pound it in a mortar. We buy sugar. Boil it and add to the dried wood powder. With seeds from the NGOs and land graciously provided by leaders of the Malkoi community, the men grow maize, millet, beans, and other crops around the camp, while some grow vegetables near their shanties. However, with a small parcel of land to farm on, little or no farm impute such as fertilizer and pesticides, the farms do not yield much. This bean farm, for instance, is under attack by pests, but there's hardly anything they can do about it. We can't afford to get pesticides. One liter of the chemical costs between 2,200 and 2,300 naira. You see the crops, they are dying. It is not possible to treat them because of the cost of pesticides. We don't even have food to eat, let alone money to buy pesticides. The farms cannot feed them, but at least they give the IDPs something to do with their time. Their food supplies mainly come from donations. Oxfam came and registered us and started bringing food for each household every other month. They also gave us tarpaulins to cover our houses. There were no toilets. Oxfam built the toilets for us. They also gave us boreholes. With newborn babies and others well on their way, the Malkoi camp is ever growing. Idrissa Abdullahi is the leader of the camp. Like most of the men here, he has a large family and cannot wait to return home to Goza once it is safe enough to do so. Even if they want us to return to Goza this night, we are ready. We are all eager to return home where we can farm, have access to water, and where we are free. We can even farm during dry season. But here, unless someone helps, we can't do anything. At home, we know one another. We want to go back to Goza. We are feeling the pains. It is difficult to feed. Truly, our situation deserves pity. In one year, we have two or three birds. I have four wives, 19 children. Who would take care of them? The displaced persons in the Malkoi camp are well over half of the 125,689 IDPs living among host communities in Adamawa state. Adamawa is one of the three northeastern states which holds 95% of the people displaced by the Boko Haram insurgency. Borno is the epicenter, while Yobe also took much of the spillover. IDP camps and communities in these three states currently play host to almost 2 million men, women and children displaced by the crisis. The number of displaced persons in the Northeast has reduced considerably from almost 3 million at the height of the insurgency because of the successes recorded by the military in the fight against Boko Haram since 2014. In Adamawa State, apart from Madagali local government area, where there is still a spillover of the fighting from the last frontiers of the Boko Haram conflict in Neburu Borno State, all other local government areas are free of insurgent activities. And almost all the indigents who sought refuge in Yola and other urban centers have returned home. Michika is the last local government area before Madagali. Even here, the residents have returned since January 2015. It's exactly 21 months since the displaced people of Michika returned to their communities. Their major occupation is farming. 
They had to abandon their homes and farms when they fled from Boko Haram. Farmers Market is on a mission to find out how they are settling back in almost two years after they returned. Varieties of highly nutritious rice in Abakaliki, Ofada, Kano. Yet Nigeria wastes billions on rice importation. Cocoa in the southwest, and yet top dollar is spent on imported chocolate and beverages. Fruits rot in Benue, Nasarawa, Kogi, yet imported Jews line the shops. 82 million hectares of rich arable land, yet no jobs and food insecurity threatens. Our real wealth is in farming, livestock, hatcheries, fisheries, horticulture, and forestry. It's time to act different. Time to bring Nigerian farmers to the market. Farmers Market, growing Nigeria's agroeconomy. Showing every Tuesday at 5.30 p.m. on AIT. It is a revealing journey from Yola to Michika. The frequent military and mobile police checkpoint on the 220-kilometer road between Yola, the Adamawa state capital, and Michika accentuates the unease that still pervades the area. Motorists have to approach the checkpoint cautiously, leaving several meters between them and the vehicles in front. And they can only approach when beckoned by the security officers. The road itself is in a terrible shape and traveling on it, one quickly understands why it was practically impossible for the crisis in Borno State not to spill into Adamawa State. This is Borno State. Precisely, I'm standing in Askira Uba, where these ladies are fetching water from this hand pump. If you follow me across the road, I'll be taking you to Adamawa State. Precisely, Uba in Adamawa State. And of course, a group of young children are also fetching water from a handheld pump across the road. Now, this is the road that separates them, and it is a very bad road. A journey that would normally take about two hours from Yola to Michika now takes about four. The heavy security presence, the potholes and craters on the road are not the only factors that make the journey slow and painful. There are also no functional bridges on the stretch. I'm standing right on Kuzum Bridge. It links Hong local government behind me and of course Michika local government right in front of me. Now this is one of the bridges that was destroyed in the heat of the Boko Haram crisis. Just over a year ago, there was no sign of life in this community. That is because all of those who live here had taken refuge in Yola. Now the sign that life has indeed returned uh, to this community are the farms on either side of the river Kuzum. The farmers are growing rice, millet, beans and other crops on the banks of the Kuzum River just as there are farms on both sides of the entire stretch of the road. The bridges are broken. Where are the people maintaining these bridges, these two bridges? We spent a lot of money and a lot of our time maintaining these two bridges. Otherwise, they couldn't have been habitable. No. I mean, heavy vehicles cannot cross River Kuzum. No. What they do is that they go, when they want to come here, they come from Yola, Mararaba, Mararaba, Mubi, down to Baza, by passing this road because they cannot pass it. This is Baza, the first major town in Michika local government area. We are immediately greeted by this crowd of women, old and young, children and some men too. In their hundreds, they wait to get bags of rice and beans provided through donor assistance. We thank Oxfamo, we thank CISCOP, we thank them for giving us this food because they have been helping us a lot here in Minchika. We thank them all and we pray that they will continue helping us all, not that they will leave us like this all. 
This is how they have survived since they returned early last year. Right from the time we were in Yola before coming back home, Oxfam has assisted us with the food stops. I think we got about two or three supplies of food from Oxfam. We thought this supply has ended in Michika, in Yola. But surprisingly, when we came back, Oxford still followed us with supply of food stores in Baza. Even though they are farmers who have eagerly returned to till the land, they have pretty much been on their own. Apart from seed support from the non-governmental organizations, the farmers have not been able to access farm inputs such as fertilizer and pesticides. No fertilizer. Even when we farm, there is no yield. We cannot go to the farms out of fear. There is fear in the land. There is no hospital in the community. No drugs. There is no road to the farm or to the market. We are not feeling the presence of government. Besides, it is unwise to stay too long in the farms or go to farms that are too far away from the town because of fear and the fighting that still goes on in neighboring Madagali local government area. Even if they go to the bush, you hear uh, gunshots and uh, heavy bombs, uh, especially within the neighboring local government of Madagali. Uh, so people have not been able to come to full grip of their farmland now. They are just managing till when God will just bring permanent peace to them. There's still apprehension and fear. I give you a typical example in Lhasa. Lhasa is uh, southern Borno from Askiraoba local government. I was there three weeks ago. I worked there for close to two weeks, targeting communities around Was uh, Lhasa, Wamdio, and Askiraoba. It, it was an market day, and there was no network. And the military, there was a military. Uh, uh, armored car that got spoiled some months back and that very day it was a market day it was fixed you will not believe because it was fixed and it made a lot of noise the market was decided people started running L women were falling over their goods i mean people got in 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 injured on the process i even ran myself with, with my team we all ran before we came back in mitika local government area there's hardly any meaningful presence of government apart from the heavy security this is the local government headquarters. It is still in ruins after being destroyed by the insurgents. Local government workers still operate under trees. Almost two years after their return, even the local government workers cannot support themselves, let alone help the farmers to boost their yield. As of now, uh, we don't have anything to support them with. Only that uh, we are advising them to go on uh, farming so as to get something to eat in their houses. It is therefore not a surprise that no infrastructural restoration has taken place in Michika local government area. Electricity poles are still broken and dangling. Cables lie in rolled heaps on the ground while others hang precariously. Of course, the cables pose no threat. There's been no electricity in Michika local government area for over three years. There's also no pipe borne water. The water points were contaminated or even destroyed outrightly by the insurgents. The returnees are only able to get water because of the benevolence of donor agencies. Some of the existing wells were used as uh, dumping grounds for dead bodies. Some of the harm pumps were vandalized. The main water sources by the water board, Adamal State Water Board, has been vandalized. And since then, they've not been fixed back. Now, as an interim measure that we are doing now is to rehabilitate their boreholes. Uh, there are quite a, lot of, uh, a handful of boreholes that are here. We conducted an, uh, a knowledge, attitude, and practice study that's CAP study, and uh, we found out that most of the people have to travel long distances to get water, or they have to stay in queues to get clean water. 
In Michika, the headquarters of the council itself, the telltale signs of Boko Haram occupation are still evident in the markings on the houses. These markings set these houses, including the palace of the district head, apart as those confiscated and occupied by insurgent commanders. They have since retreated, but their prints remain, even on Michika's commercial establishments. Those who want to assist us are discouraged by the state of the bridges. The roads are bad. There are no banks here. That's a problem. Even for a 15 or 20,000 naira transaction, you must go to Yola to assess the money. Despite all these challenges, the strong-willed farmers of Michika have continued to do their bit, and their leaders are optimistic that their resilience will pay off at harvest time. We are expecting a bumper harvest from what us, I mean, the Red Cross has given us. But our fear now is that what will actually make us to, uh, to make our hope are being dashed was the, the condition of the rain. The rain is no longer uh, I mean, coming in the, man, in the way and man it used to be coming in around this time of the year. The crisis has really, really caused a lot of havoc. Farmlands, livestock, businesses, loved ones, places of worship, a whole community, some of them. In fact, some of the things, uh, you, you can only imagine it. You will not believe it has happened until you go to see some of this community to see for yourself. So, and we should not also forget to celebrate the resilience of these people. When you go to some of this community, you will be shocked that this is a community that was taken over and destroyed. But people have gone back, not because they have anything, but because that is their town. Not really because the tanks are support, the tanks, military tanks are guiding them, but because the sheer will to survive and to go back to a community. And that is a success story I think we should celebrate. The experience of the farmers in Michika is an eye-opener to the fact that the humanitarian and food crisis in Nigeria's northeast may be prolonged much more than necessary if displaced persons who choose to return to their communities are not quickly and adequately resettled. That's Farmer's Market for this week. Now, let's talk about this critical issue. No doubt it is absolutely necessary to feed the victims of insurgency who are taking refuge in IDP camps. However, do you think that it is also critical that ample attention and resources are given to communities that have been liberated to help returnees resettle quickly and adequately? That's the big question for this week. Send your comments to our Facebook page or go to our website www.farmersmarketng.com Click on Farmers Network, choose the topic, make your contributions brief and they will feature next week on Farmers Market. You can see this program again whenever you want to. Just visit our website www.farmersmarketng.com for feedback and sponsorship considerations, please contact us on 09 Email us on info at farmersmarketng.com. Follow us on Twitter at farmersmarketng. And like our Facebook page. It's facebook.com forward slash farmersmarketng. Farmers Market returns same time, same station next week. Thanks for watching.